Hi, everybody. Welcome to Satellite 2020. Sorry we got off to a late start. DC traffic is a killer. But uh, my name is Jeffrey Hill. I'm the conference chair, and I'm here with Elon Musk, chief engineer and founder of SpaceX. Elon, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I guess it was uh, 11 years ago that we met. Yeah, and, and when we met 11 years ago, we were talking uh, about Falcon 1, Falcon 9 at the time. And uh, when I asked you, what's, what's the point of all this? You said, to send human beings back into space on a US built rocket from a US built facility so that we could permanently resettle other, other planets. And here we are, we're right on the, the, the brink here of uh, sending humans back into space. Uh, the, the Crew Dragon is in uh, Cape Canaveral. How do you feel that you're on the doorstep here? Um, yeah, it's great that we're about to launch people to, to orbit. Uh, it's been a long time. Long um, road. 18 years. Yeah. Kid, kid, could be, kid could be in college by now. <laughs> yeah. Is it like sending your kid off to college? Well, we haven't done it yet, but it's a long time. You're, you're packing, you're packing the bags. You're, you're ready to go. Can you talk about the, um, the, the talk about the, the road from uh, the space shuttle to the Crew Dragon? Like, talk about the, the, what are some of the challenges that you faced in creating a, uh, a human rated uh, space, uh, spacecraft for, for a human space flight. What were some of the challenges that you encountered along the way? Well, the thing, that, the thing that concerns me most right now is that unless we improve our rate of innovation dramatically, then there is no chance of a base on the moon or a city on Mars. Not, I'll be, yeah, this is my biggest concern. Um, Crew Dragon was, we, we, we've already taken it to the space station and back. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people aren't aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had like a, basically a dummy, you know. So, um, and then since what then, we've done massive amount of testing, you know, pushing all the corner cases, uh, and uh, just a, a truly ridiculous amount of, of, of testing. It's like, definitely had us off to the, Dragon engineers and supporting team at NASA for going through a truly staggering number of tests. Um, now, that, now that that said, uh, Dragon really is just a low Earth orbit transport vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really just it's capable of taking a few people at what is still a very high cost to Earth orbit. I mean, technically, we could send people around the moon on Dragon, but I'm not sure we'd want to. Um, it's too, too small. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. So it, it, it's good, good to get this done, uh, but it's, I, I think we need to be very careful of getting stuck in a local maximum. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, the space shuttle was something that was really stuck in a local maximum for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we, we don't want to be that situation. I mean, fr frankly, wh why is why does Soyuz still fly? I mean, Karlov is probably turning in his grave right now. Mm -hmm. Right. It's an interesting. It's an interesting question. It was designed in the fifties. Yeah. Right. Right. If you told them, if, if you told Karlov and the other guys that they'd still be, we'd still be flying Soyuz in twenty twenty, they'd be like, "That's crazy." <laughs> Yet we are. Um, so we don't want to be in that situation, you know. It's a solid vehicle. It's just like it's time to move on. Right. Right. And so we, uh, you know, we, I know we started late. I sourced a lot of these questions from the from the public and the audience. We're also going to do a Q and A here. So I'm just going to jump right into the questions that we received. Um, so I mean, the most popular question we got was like, what are the greatest challenges uh, or the biggest challenges we face in expanding our presence in space and exploring and eventually resettling new worlds? There's really just one thing that matters that is a fully and rapidly reusable rocket. Uh, that, that's the one thing that matters. Um, and it needs to be reasonably big uh, or your payload to non-payload ratio will be kind of whacked. 
uh, you know, won't, won't be good. So just like you wouldn't want a super tanker growing, like you, when you, you know, container ships, you have a container ship with thousands of containers. You, you don't, you know, have like a bunch of tiny ships with little outboards on them cruising across the Pacific. That would be silly. Um, so you have big ships when you want to go long distances with serious cargo. So we need a fairly big, but definitely rapidly and completely reusable rocket. This is the fundamental thing. Without that, we're going nowhere. And um, what level of reusability is uh, SpaceX actively pursuing for, for Falcon 9, for Dragon, for Starship? I think Falcon 9 and Dragon have the, the, their asymptoting, the, their, their, te their technology architecture is asymptoting, meaning like it, it, it really would not make sense to have a Block 6 Falcon 9, you know, from where we are right now. It just doesn't make sense. Um, that's why we have a big focus in terms of new technology development on Starship. Um, for Falcon and, and Falcon and Dragon are kind of like operational vehicles at this point. So they're, they're, they're good products, they're operational, um, but, but there's not really, but, but we need a whole new architecture, and that's what Starship is about. Mm -hmm. um, and Starship needs to be fully and completely reusable, and rapidly so. Um, I mean, it's, it's being designed for about, an, uh, you know, to, to be relaunch, relaunched an hour after landing mm -hmm. with, with zero nominal work. Like you could have scheduled maintenance you, or you could have like something like a spork issue, just like commercial aircraft, but you're expected, the, the only thing you expect to change on a regular basis is propellant. Mm -hmm. um, and it's gotta be fast. Mm -hmm. So um, now, now that for the ship, you, you, you've got to wait, unless you're launching Dewey's from the equator, you, you've got to have, figure out some way to get, get the, the ship uh, orbital ground track to pass over the landing site, otherwise you're too far away. Um, so the ship maybe, it might take, you know, three orbits, four orbits maybe, to get back over the, the, the launch site. Uh, but, but I think we, we want to aim for a capability of three flights a day for the ship. Wow. And most of which is taken up with getting the orbital you know, ground track to come over the, the launch site. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then an hour for everything else. And you know, every, everybody's in, interested in, in the, uh, the mission to Mars, uh, planetary resettlement. When talking about reusability for the launch vehicle, uh, what are your thoughts on in-space resource utilization? Uh, for example, water, oxygen, soil um, from the moon, perhaps, maybe to go to Mars. Uh, do you have any plans to uh, utilize resources um, in space for the mission to Mars? Uh, nope. I mean, apart from uh, orbital refilling, mm -hmm. I think uh, that's very important. So you've got to... So there's one ex besides a fully and re fully and rapid rapidly reusable um, rocket, you need to also have orbital refilling or retanking. Mm -hmm. That's got to be that's fundamental because um, then you can essentially recoup uh, all of your mass fraction delta v mm -hmm. in Earth orbit. You can leave with full tanks, um, and it could could be from immediate low Earth orbit or you know, something that's maybe elliptical or something like that if you want to go higher energy. But that, that's crucial for getting to, to Mars. The, the moon is neither here nor there. Um, I mean, using the moon would be like, okay, if you want to cross the Atlantic, maybe you want to go to Iceland, probably not, you know. But, you know, to visit, sure, but you know, it's not like a mandatory stop, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and also, for the mission to Mars, um, what advancements, we, we talk a lot about hardware and physics problems, and, and what about advancements in software? Um, you know, the reason I bring this up, it, recently, are you familiar with the game designer Jonathan Blow? 
he referenced you in a keynote he was given, and he said that you, you would talk about technology naturally decays because skills naturally fade. And one of the things he identified was a decay in software, um, a de degradation in software. Uh, is this something we have to address in, in, in doing something like going to Mars and since all of this stuff runs on software? Well, so software is an increasing part of any piece of technology. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Tesla, the car is extremely configurable. It's basically like a laptop on wheels. Um, so software matters enormously there. Um, and, and really, for, for example, for full autonomy, the only gating factor is software. The hardware is all there that's required it, and has been for the last couple of years. Uh, well, well, the final piece of hardware was upgrading the computer to have more compute power. Um, so software is extremely important. Um, the point you're alluding to, which is that, you know, what I was referring to is technology does not automatically improve. Right. Uh, people are used to the phone being better every year. Um, although, and I'm an iPhone user, but I think like some of the recent software updates have been like not great. Certainly, feeding at that point, um, it like broke my email system. Like what the, <laughs> this is like quite fundamental. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, there sure is a lot of software out there, and some of it's like the the people that wrote it are retired or maybe dead. You know, so it's like, now how do you fix it? It's going to be an issue. Um, I think we definitely need a lot more smart people working software. Um, and not just troubleshooting old problems. Not just troubleshooting old problems. It's actually very important to retire old code bases and, and not just maintain them forever because mm -hmm. the, the, the difficulty of maintaining them j becomes extremely high. Yeah. At a certain point, you just got to redo the code base. So we'll come back to the Mars mission because I know we've got some uh, audience questions on that. You know, we're at a satellite conference, so I'm going to ask you some questions about satellites. Uh, Starlink. Um, what's the long-term vision for Starlink? Uh, how do you see the role of Starlink as it relates to mobile broadband and 5G? Uh, sure. So, I mean, the, the, the whole purpose of SpaceX is really to help make life multiplanetary. Um, and then, but the revenue potential of launching rock, launching satellites, services in the space station, and whatnot, that's you know t taps out around three billion dollars a year. Um, but I think uh, providing broadband is is more like an order of magnitude more than that, probably thirty billion a year, mm -hmm. um, as as a rough approximation. Um, and we're still like probably below five percent at that point. So it's not like. I want to be clear, like, it's not like Starlink is some huge threat to telcos. I want to be super clear, it is not. <laughs> uh, in fact, it will be helpful to telcos because uh, Starlink will, ha will, will um, serve the hardest to serve customers that uh, telcos otherwise have trouble doing with, with landlines or even with, with uh, cell radio stations, you know, s s with cell, cell towers. Mm -hmm. um, 5G is, is, is great for high density situations like being here in DC or you know New York, San Francisco, that kind of thing. 5G is great for high density situations, but it's actually not great for um, the countryside. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for rural areas, it's it's not it's not great. You need you need range, um, and so any, any any kind of sparse environment, uh, 5G is is really not not well suited. Um, but it's Great, great for in, for for city dense, dense city situations. So Starlink will effectively serve the I don't know three or four percent hardest to reach customers for telcos or or people who simply have no connectivity right now, um, or the connectivity is really bad. So I think it, it will be actually helpful um, and take a, a significant load off the traditional telcos. Okay, and I was. I was going to ask you what, what customers uh, you know, were ideally suited for Starlink, but I guess since you mentioned that it would be it would be these uh, three to four percent at the very something like that um, at the very edge. What, what is the customer uh, experience like then for those people, and what's the cost of, uh, of acquiring those services? 
Um, well, it will be a, a truly a good experience because it'll be very low latency. Mm -hmm. um, and we're targeting latency below 20 milliseconds. Uh, so somebody could, could, could play a, a fast response video game uh, at a competitive level. Right. Like that's the threshold for uh, the latency. Um, so, uh, so then, and, and band bandwidth, the bandwidth is a very complex question, um, but let's just say somebody will be able to watch high def movies, mm -hmm. um, play, play video games, and do all the things they want to do without noticing speed. Right. Um, and then the, the, the challenge for anything that is uh, space-based is that the, the size of the cell is gigantic. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's, like I said, it's great for, for uh, very low to maybe maybe medium s uh, sort of sparsity situations, but it's not, uh, it's not good for high density situations. We'll, we'll have some small number of customers in LA, but we, we can't do a lot of customers in LA because the bandwidth per cell is, is simply not uh, high enough. Mm -hmm. um, what does is, what is the equipment on the ground look like for this? What is it? Yeah, um, so the, the, the ground equipment just looks like, uh, well, I think it's, like I said, I think it looks like a little, Euro, looks like a UFO on a stick. Mm -hmm. um, so the, at least the version one of the user terminal will actually have actuators on it so that it can, it, it can um, improve the pointing accuracy. So you don't have to, it's very important that you don't need a specialist uh, or some, to install. Um, it, the, the goal is that this, the, the, the instructions on the box will, there's just two instructions and they can be done in either order. Uh, point at sky, plug in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you do it either order, sequence doesn't matter, and it will work. Plug and play. Literally, <laughs> but also point at sky. <clears throat> point at <laughs> you can't see the satellites. If you, if you can't see the satellites, it can't see you. Mm -hmm. um, just. <laughs> Wanted to talk about just some of the design uh, concerns that were raised by astronomers. Um, can you talk about little, a little bit about how you working, maybe working with astronomers to alleviate these concerns, or, or are you working on the design or altering it, or, or is, are the concerns uh, overblown? I mean, how do you feel about what has been raised? Um, I, I am confident that we will not cause any impact whatsoever in astronomical discoveries. Okay. Zero. That's my prediction. So you're if, not launching them? We'll take corrective action if it's above zero. <laughs> so you're not giving like Orion a hat or anything like that? You're, every, everything's... No, I mean, there's, there's a, sometimes people get a little excited because when the, when the satellites are first uh, launched, Mm -hmm. that they're, they're tumbling a little bit, so they're, like, they're kind of like, they're gonna right. blink, um, and, because they, they haven't stabilized, um, and then, and they're, they're raising their orbit, so they're, they're lower than you'd expect, and they're kind of necessarily gonna reflect in ways that is not the case when they're on orbit. Uh, but now, now that the satellites are, are on orbit, uh, I'd be impressed if, if somebody can actually tell me where, where all of them are. Mm. I've not met someone who can tell me where all of them are, not even one person. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, that, I mean, it can't be that big of a deal. To be clear, we, we, we are actually working with senior members of the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the science community and, and senior astronomers to minimize the potential for reflection mm -hmm. uh, of the satellites. So. Um, you know, we're, and we're, we're running a bunch of experiments to, for example, um, uh, just ha have a, a paint the um, phase array antenna black instead of white, um, and we're um, working on a, a sun shade because th there there are like certain angles where if the sun gets you know just sort of just right. Um, and there's not like a little sunshade, we're not talking about a lot here, then you can get a reflection. Um, and so we were launching a sunshade, uh, changing the, the, the color of the satellites, um, and otherwise minimizing the, um, the potential for any, any impact. 
Uh, e even like a, 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 aesthetically, this, this should not be an impact, I think. Recently, uh, Gwen Chatwell uh, in Bloomberg was quoted as saying that you, know, you were exploring splitting Starlink from SpaceX. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, why that would happen, and how you see both of these independent companies functioning, and, and just talk a little bit about that? We're thinking about that zero. Is that, we're thinking about that what? Zero. Zero? Zero. Not thinking about it at all. We need to make the thing work. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's far from obvious that, I, I mean, it's real important to just set the stage here for LEO communications constellations. Guess how many uh, LEO constellations uh, didn't go bankrupt? Mm -hmm. Zero. Right. Zero. Um, you know, Iridium is doing okay now, but the Iridium One went bankrupt. Worldcom went bankrupt. Um, Global Star bankrupt. Teledesic bankrupt. Am I leaving anyone out? There's a bunch of others that didn't get very far. They also went bankrupt. Anyway, they all went bankrupt. <laughs> so you're focusing on making it work first. Uh, not bankrupt. Right, and not going. <laughs> that, that would be a big step. <laughs> to have like more than zero in the not bankrupt category. How would you, I mean, with, how does it work then with the, the, the business of SpaceX since you're like, I mean, you are launching other constellations. Uh, is that, is that a, an issue? Does that cause a, a conflict or? We're launching other constellations? Oh, you're launching other satellites. So what, oh, yeah, sure, whatever, yeah, no problem. <laughs> of course. Right. So there's no like, you know. We're you know even giving them a good deal, by the way. <laughs> Like, uh, no problem. You want to launch Constellation on SpaceX? Sounds good to me. So? I mean, I, I think, that, you know, I think there's, there's, the world seems to have an insatiable appetite for bandwidth. So we're certainly happy to launch other satellites. And, um, you know, we don't think Starlink is going like, to destroy all other satellites or something like that. Or definitely not. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, we just want to be in the not bankrupt category. That's our goal. Um, since you're since you're now the company of SpaceX, now you know you're you're building your launching satellites. Are you are you looking at expanding the business of SpaceX into other areas of commercial satellite uh, connectivity? Maybe like we, we talked a little bit about the you know you're already building like technology on the ground. Are there other areas that you're looking to get into in terms of commercial uh, space connectivity or satellite services? Um, no, we're already. There's just there's two major new technology programs at SpaceX. That's Starlink and Starship. Mm -hmm. Well, like, it kind of has star in the name of it too much. If I, I mean, we just call it like Link and Ship. If you divide the one by the other, mm -hmm. the, the stars net out, and then it's just Link and Ship. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. Um, as far as I know, anyway. I mean, it could be some secret project that's so secret. I even I don't know about it. You don't know, have a business under the chair. Or something. Uh, <laughs> I don't think there's anything major. Okay. Um, so I want to I want to give time for uh, people in the audience to ask some questions. But uh, you know, we talked about uh, Starship. Um, so development at Boca Chica is um, moving along pretty quickly. And uh, uh, yeah, actually, that was the real reason I was late. Is because I was at Boca Chica. My apologies. Uh, I was just uh, working on Starship uh, with the team there. So it's pretty cool out there. Actually, I like it. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that's uh, underway, what we can expect in the future for, for Starship? Well, we're building a, a production line. Mm -hmm. Pro production line is the hard part. You know, making one of something is, is, is well, at this point, you know, like frankly, designing rockets is not that hard. Um, especially if it's an expendable rocket, it's not, a, not really a hard problem. You can literally read books that'll tell you exactly how to do it. Um, the hard part is now actually building that thing even once is hard, and then building a production line is a thousand percent harder, mm -hmm. uh, like at least a thousand percent harder, yeah. maybe more. So just in general, production and manufacturing is underappreciated, um, I think, especially in the US, uh, frankly. Uh, so we, we should really pay a lot more attention and care a lot more uh, about manufacturing. Mm -hmm. This is, yeah, 
this is an honest day's work, let me tell you. Um, also, what, what inspired some of the design aesthetics of the spacecraft? I mean, it's stainless steel, it's a, uh, it's a striking uh, uh, design uh, for, a, for a spacecraft. But what, what inspired uh, you, you know, your vision for the way it looks, the way it functions? Like, why, why stainless steel? Why? Well, we, we were <clears throat> going to make it out of advanced composites. And the advanced composites, they cost like $60 a pound, or $60 a kilogram, like a little more than that, maybe $130 a pound. Um, and there was 60 to 120 plies for the, the tank. It was taking forever. We weren't making good progress. It cost crazy money. And I was like, okay, switching to aluminum lithium is also a pain in the neck. We do that. That's what we use for the Falcon 9 tanks because it's hard to weld because of the reactivity of the lithium. So, um, you know what's easy to weld? Steel. Steel's really easy to weld. Uh, and stainless steel doesn't even require paint. That sounds great, because the paint shop's a pain in the neck. Mm. Um, and you want, want to try painting something that's got to go to drop to cryogenic temperatures and then bend a lot? It's like, forget it. I mean, that paint wants to come off like there's no tomorrow. Mm. Um, it does not like to stick. So then you could use special paint. And then the special paint also can't get, uh, like when you're going vertically at like uh, supersonic, you get the, uh, basically static electricity buildup called triboelectrification. Well, that always reminds me of the trouble of troubles. Um, but you can basically zap yourself mm -hmm. um, if you have uh, paint that, the wrong paint. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, this, uh, no paint is great. Uh, yeah. So we need a big, friggin' big ass paint job for Starship. Yeah. One like, less problem to think. One about. less problem, mm -hmm. and paint doesn't weigh zero. Right. Um, uh, you know, they they used to paint the the shuttle external tank white, but then like, they're like, uh, well, we're adding a lot of weight to this thing, and it's a big pain in the neck, so we'll leave <laughs> just have it stay orange. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just not painting it is great. So. Then, you know, and we're not the first to use steel. Like, um, they used 301 in the early Atlas program. Uh, Charlie Bossert, uh, I, think it was, I think it was his idea. Um, obviously, other people involved. But Charlie Bossert, by the way, that guy is underappreciated. He kicks ass. It's really great. Just read about his, his, his stuff. He's, he's just awesome. Um, so he used 301. Uh, so obviously, it's not a new alloy. Um, I think we're, we're, we're going to start switching to a different alloy pretty soon um, and then just t tweak the alloy constituents because we should be able to do better in 2020 than they, were, that they did in like the 50s, you know. So, I mean, come on. So, I think we'll probably start switching away from 301 maybe in the next month or two. Okay. Um, n now, the funny thing is that, like, I actually knew that steel especially 301 full hard steel couldn't be that heavy because uh, the original Atlas had a very good mass fraction, mm -hmm. right? So it can't be that wrong, bad. Um, and um, if you look at the normal, normal sort of standard material sheet for 301, um, it will usually not tell you what th that it work hardens dramatically and improves the strength dramatically with work hardening um, and also at cryogenic temperatures, it, it improves strength dramatically. So mm -hmm. then the, if you combine the work hardening with the, the, the cryo strength improvement, you get an effective uh, strength to weight that is about the same as an as advanced composite. Mm -hmm. um, now, people will generally make a mistake with composites because they'll look at the material sheet and not realize that, okay, with composites, you've got to have a big knockdown. Because you basically have composites are string and glue, and so you, you get, and, and there, you can't just like have like let's say your your problem calls for having four plies of, of carbon. You can't just have four plies. You need like five or six because in case you damage one or something like that, um, and you say what's your worst case allowable for a D bond or something like that. 
So the actual knockdown unit peaking for composites is more than you would for a metal structure. So people often, so it's, it's like a classic movie mistake is to overrate carbon fiber. Because um, you just, you, you look at the material data sheet and it looks like an obvious move, but it's not. Um, so anyway, so at hydrogenic temperatures, the steel is, has a de facto strength to weight about the same as advanced composite. Um, but, and that doesn't not even counting the fact that you have to paint the composite, you don't have to paint the steel. Right. Um, then there's a, another factor which is, if you want to have a reusable vehicle, it's gonna get hot. Right. Uh, composites don't like getting hot. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, typically your, your composite maybe is comfortable up to around 150, 200 Celsius, something like that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and things start getting pretty sketchy around 250C. I mean, like, you start having to use advanced resins and all that kind of thing. Um, so, whereas steel's pretty happy at 1000C, you know, no, no, and no problem at, fi at 500, you can sit at 500C all day. Um, and brief periods of 1000C, no problem. So, then, for a reusable vehicle, you now need zero heat shielding on the leeward side. Um, normally you'd need some heat shielding just due to, due to um, radiative heating on the back. Um, so you don't have a lot of convective heating at hypersonic, but you have radiative heating. And then uh, you can thin out the uh, windward side of the, the, the heat shield because the thickness of the, of the heat shield uh, tile is driven by uh, the temperature on the back side of the tile where it mounts the primary structure. Mm -hmm. So if, you go, if your primary structure can take um, a high heat, that means you can thin out the tile. Um, so think, think of it like these, like, like oven mitts or something. You know, right. if you have like, how ha hot can your hand go? Um, and that sets how thick your oven mitt is. Right. Um, so, so then you can have, like I said, no, no heat shield on the leeward side on, on a, and, and a thin heat shield on the windward side. Mm -hmm. So now your actual total mass of a steel uh, of a reusable steel spacecraft is less than that of the most advanced carbon fiber vehicle you could possibly imagine. Yeah, wow. But this is happened by accident, by the way. This may sound like some great insight, but it actually happened because we were moving too slowly on composite, um, and I was like, we cannot move this slowly or we'll go bankrupt. So right. let's get through this with steel. So, you ha I mean, the design has to be focused on problem solving, otherwise you're gonna to spend too much time trying to figure, you, you don't start with a, yeah. Yeah, I'm like uh, sort of taking to management, management by rhyming. If the schedule is, schedule is long, your design is wrong. <laughs> right. This is very true. Good, good point. Yes. With that, I wanna to go to some audience questions. We asked uh, the audience through the, uh, the app to submit us questions, so I believe we have uh, a few that we've pulled here. So uh, we've got some over here. Can we, um, and can you come closer over here so we can, we can see you? We'll say. All right, our first question. Hello, I'm Jaden Zundel. I'm a graduate student at Stanford. Uh, my question for you is, as you look back on your career in the space industry, what has been the most surprising or unexpected challenge that you faced? And along those lines, if you were to go back in time and talk to your 20-year-old self, would you do anything differently? Go back in time to your 20 year old self. I mean, I think I'd, if I get it, I think it would make a lot, far fewer mistakes, obviously, if I could go, like, here's a list of all the dumb things you're about to do, please do not do them. <laughs> Wouldn't we yeah, all? It'd be a very long list, and like, you know, here, let me I would, you know, write it down or something. You know. um, I mean, it's hindsight's 20 20, so it's hard to say. Um, I mean, number of, I've made so many foolish mistakes, I have a luck count, honestly. Um, I mean, some of these things I just wish I, like, the, the, like that's simple sort of mantra, management by rhyming. I mean, it, it worked for Homer, okay? Um, the management by rhyming is, the, that thing I was saying, like, if the, if the schedule's long, your design is wrong. 
that we've overcomplicated the design many times. Um, and, and I think we, we should have just gone with a, a simpler design. Um, with the acid test being, how long will it take to, for this to fly? And if it's gonna take a long time, don't do it, do something else. Um, and if you look at, say, Falcon 9, uh, it's, you know, it's got a, an aluminum lithium tank, but then the um, unpressurized structures are carbon fiber composite. Mm -hmm. um, and really, one of the worst possible things you could do to a joint is take something with a high coefficient of thermal expansion, high, high CTE, uh, put it, go, take it from room temperature to cryo, um, and then connect it to something that has zero CTE, you know, basically zero, like for carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. So now you've got a, a real pain in the ass joint, basically. Right. Um, so in, in, in order for that to work, you've got to, if the, the tank's got to shrink radially, and you've, you've got these super expensive, heavy bolts that are like a beam and bending uh, across, you know, that, that are then t taking load into the interstage, and they desperately want to shear off uh, or snap off. Um, this is crazy. Um, you know, really you should just have a continuous metal structure, but that's obvious that should be done. That'd be way better. Um, you know, th th things expand to fully available resources, so then, like, sometimes you, you should say no to things that you, that you don't. Um, you know, like the original Falcon 1 team, which did the, the, the fairing, tanks, engines, er everything pretty much, was maybe a little over 100 people. Okay. And now SpaceX is like 6,000 people, I think, something like that. Um, so, so really just simplify your product as much as possible. Um, You know, and, and then like, if, if I think of some of the ways in which, how does a smart engineer make dumb mistakes, including, you know, is, is optimize something that shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. Don't optimize something that shouldn't exist. Um, but people are trained to do this in college. You can't say no to the professor. You know, the professor's gonna give you the, the exam and you've gotta answer all the questions or they will get angry. Um, so, and give you a bad grade. So then you, you always optimize the, you always answer the question. So a lot of the times you should say this is the wrong question. Mm -hmm. Right. In fact, the question is definitely wrong to some degree, just how wrong. Um, and I think just generally taking the approach that your design is some degree wrong, probably a lot more than you think, your goal is to make it less wrong over time. We have a, let's go to another question. Uh, hi, my name is Julie Seven Sage, and uh, Mr. Musk, you have said in the past that you think that college degrees shouldn't be that important, and that has been showed in job listings in places such as Tesla. However, in uh, places like CIS industry, including even at SpaceX, um, in the satellite development area, many of the job listings say that you need at least a bachelor's degree and prefer at least a master's degree. So my question to you is with um, uh, more jobs asking for higher levels of degrees, the scholarships are not changing amounts and that it's getting harder and harder every year to pay tuition even with using scholarships. How can colleges and industries make it easier to afford college, but at the same time being able to pay grad students and employees well, and also to make sure that there is a large scale access to good colleges, especially to underprivileged communities so that everyone can be a part of the future we're building. Thank you. Well, first of all, you don't need college to learn, it, learn stuff, okay? Everything is available basically for free. Uh, you can learn anything you want for free. It is not a question of learning. Um, 
there, there is a value that colleges have, which is like, you know, seeing whether somebody's, is, can somebody work hard at something, including a bunch of sort of annoying homework assignments and still do their homework assignments uh, and, and kind of soldier through and, and, and get it done. You know, that's, that's like the, the main value of college. And then also, you, you know, if you, you, if you probably want to hang around with a bunch of people your own age for a while instead of going right into the workforce. Um, so I think colleges are basically for fun and to prove you can do your chores, but they're not for learning. There it is. Um, I know we started late, and I know we, we, uh, we don't have much time left, but to build on Julie's question here, um, how does somebody like you with, with a very long-term mission of going to Mars, how are you co cultivating the next generation of leadership to take you there? Because, I mean, this is, this is a long-term project. We might, we might not be around to see us finally resettle on Mars, or, or may, maybe... No, I mean, I, I, ho I hope I'm not dead by the time uh, people go to Mars. That would be a great, uh, great outcome, I think. I might be, you know, if we don't improve our pace of progress, I'm definitely, you know, going to be dead before we go to Mars. So um, I'm just like, would like to not be dead when by the time we go to Mars. That's <laughs> my aspiration here. Um, so if it's taken us 18 years just to get ready to do the first people to orbit, we better improve our rate of innovation or, you know, based on past trends, I am definitely going to be dead before Mars. So, uh, so we're going to imp improve our pace of innovation a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Um, I guess what I would say is, you, I, I can tell you can uh, see, you, how do you communicate that vision you have to, that, to the, somebody who could maybe take over for what you're doing and to see things the way you're seeing them in terms of the, the mission. Well, we have a lot of good good people at SpaceX. That you know, um, a lot of really talented people. Uh, in fact, I wonder, like sometimes, w w how we can make use of their talents in the best way. Because uh, you know, I think we're often not using their talents in the best way. Um, yeah, but. I, you know, to, to the point of the question that was just asked, I want to make sure Tesla recruiting does not have anything that says requires university, because that's absurd. Uh, but there is a requirement of evidence of exceptional ability. Like, you just can't, if you're trying to do something exceptional, you must have ev evidence of exceptional ability. I don't consider going to college evidence of exceptional ability. In fact, ideally, you dropped out and did something. I mean, obviously, you know, we just look at like, you know, Gates is a pretty smart guy, he dropped out. Uh, Jobs, pretty smart, he dropped out. You know, Larry Ellison, smart guy, he dropped out. I'm like, obviously not needed. So Did Shakespeare even go to college? Uh, probably not. I mean, <laughs> well, I, I'm, uh, thank you so much. I, I wish we could take more uh, audience questions. I know we have, we have a hard stop, but thank you, Elon, for stopping right. by. Thank you, let's give him a round of applause for stopping by. And speaking to us. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and uh, see you soon. Right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. All right.